Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, look, it's going on its own. That's, that's, that's the way things work in India. And you know, everything takes a life of its own. It augurs well for the future. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you a brief idea about um, uh, the status of art conservation in India. So this was a conference we had last year. It was attended by about 300 people from around the country. We called it Steady Steps Ahead. A lot of connotations to the way you think of the word steady steps ahead. Um, and uh, it brought to the fore the fact that there is an alive cons art conservation community in the country. Um, in terms of the distribution, if, if I look at a strategy, if you look at the distribution of custodians in the country, you have the government sections and you have the private owners, the trusts, the private universities, a very huge amount of India's cultural heritage is with the monasteries and religious art has always been in uh, either the temporal domain or the or with the spectre, you know? Um, so um, monasteries and religious institutions hold a huge amount of cultural heritage in the country and then the general population. In terms of the way the custodians are distributed, we have the distribution of the practitioners. So while in terms of nomenclature, it differs in the government. They call them chemists or things because of the way uh, when the archaeological survey in India was established, that was the nomenclature. And, um, but in the, other, um, in the other sectors where they have picked on the uh, terminology, which is internationally accepted as conservator restorers, a, a very big amount and an important, uh, a very big um, um, practitioner base is the custodian. Because of the lack of the conservation professionals, the custodians play a very important role in the um, conservation of cultural heritage. So they are there. You have a lot of certificate holders who do a lot of short-term workshops and things, and they come across into the field as people who can practice. So it's an interesting situation in India where, ironically, there are a lot of resources suddenly being made available, but the training has been half-baked. So it's... Ten years back, there were not enough people, right? And the people who were willing to work did not have the resources. Today, the resources are there, but the people are not there. You have the, also the, um, there are a lot of people who deal with eth ethnographic objects in India. And these are the people who also who delve into uh, the conservation practice, into conservation practice. Then you have a number of re local resource persons who are then sourced by the custodians to do some work in conservation. And then you have a lot of, not a lot of, a few people who are coming from around the world now and doing work in different parts of country through NGOs and other things. So this makes the conservation community in India. So other than the people to be trained for formal art conservation, I think we have to address also that larger thing. To address this huge country of ours, we have to address our conservation training also on, these, on this front also. The trick is to take it forward and once backwards and you get to it. The training delivery platform. Uh, we have degrees and diplomas, right? We have certificate courses. We have um, informal training. We have workshops. And we have people working in studios. So this is the way training is imparted at the moment in India. There is, I think, a strategy uh, opportunity also of involving what the government of India has. It's called the Department of Personnel Training, DOPT and the polytechnics in India. And I think once we go through this, it reaches the entire country in a big way. So this is not just for art objects, but it also could be, also be linked to heritage conservation in terms of structures and buildings and built heritage. The opportunities post-training in terms of these delivery platforms are the state institutions in India have a lot of positions. Many of them are filled by the blue dots show you that these are filled by people who did not have formal training earlier. And they man the posts at the moment, right? At the same time, we have the red ones where they have finally accepted the, no the terminology of the trained conservator restorers. So you must remember that policy plays a big role in this, and we have to also address that. In the private sector, the people who are coming into the profession are people who are trained in the formal manner through established programs. In terms of, if I say five requirements in India at the moment, one is how to approach the conservation issue is a thing that needs to be imparted to the people who are to be, when the curriculums are to be created. 
the creation of workspaces is very important. People can do the work, but if you ask them to create your workspace, I think that becomes an issue sometimes with the institutions, with the practitioners. So the third is what to do with your available resources. There is a blind sort of um, um, leaning towards uh, uh, materials which are not readily available in your local environment. But the fact is that all these things are readily available with markets opening up now, the, whole, the world's one playing field. So all these resources are available. It's, uh, the trouble with uh, things in, in, in India, perhaps in other developing countries, is not the availability of resources. It is the optimum utilization of the resources. Conservation decisions, and then recording and reporting. These are five sectors which I think are very, very crucial to conservation training in India, other than the formal training of a conservator, as um, Deborah articulated. And exposure and apprenticeships play a great role in this. There are two parallel gaps in India in terms of uh, training. One is, the, the most important thing is language. If you see the number of people in India, if you're looking at a billion people, how many of them know English? And out of those people who know English, how many of them are actually interested in art and culture? And how many of them are then the conservators? So if all the training is only in English, we are just skimming the surface of the country. And if we want our conservation training to go further, a little bit into the soil of the nation, we have to have our, the not the local languages, but at least one official, there are, there are 22 official languages in India. So at least in those regions, that language and English simultaneously. And that will be a strategy that we are working on for the next five years to address in India. This is an opportune time. I just give you a few slides before I close of the, uh, we established this five years back, the uh, CSMVS Art Conservation Center. We have uh, been working on a huge number of projects. We have a team of 35 people at the moment. Um, we work on a range of vari variety of materials and technologies from contemporary art to ancient art, archeological objects. And there are areas that we are further developing. Workshops and training courses are an important part of our curriculum. Uh, we have lots of interns coming from different departments in various universities, as well as people who are training actually for conservation. The trainings are held not only in our center, but also we do external trainings uh, in other parts of the country. We provide exhibition supports, and a lot of institutions are now coming to India with exhibitions, and we take care of entire collection care responsibility in collaboration with them. Our research and all is based on our day-to-day -day work, things where we can provide solutions. Uh, High-end research is something that one can do with other institutions who have the facilities. Textile conservation is an area that we're gonna concentrate on. Um, we're bringing in new technologies into the country uh, because that was my alarm. I thought, I thought this was a dream and I just woke up. <laughs> um, this is, uh, um, this is the way we've been uh, working on things here. Uh, one of the issues was there was not enough sharing of the uh, materials and um, uh, the database and the um, experience, the conservation experience in India, for which we created this art conservation resurgence project. Over three years, we've been documenting materials, technologies, and, um, and now we're gonna publish a series of these reference documents for public access, including many of you. In fact, the sites are alive, and um, you could go to these sites in due course. And this has informed custodians across the country. This is that huge, when you go to India next, you see the International Airport in Bombay. 7,000 ethnographic objects from around the country have been put together on a 2.5 kilometer long exhibition within the museum. So all these objects came from around the country. Then you have the preventive conservation in the various monastic institutions that we've been working on. We've been working with craftspeople, and we've been working uh, with architects and stonemasons with traditional systems and knowledge. And we have a good network across the country, so it's time to take it forward. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.